are live. Marshall, you want to kick us off? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Coach's Corner on a uh, beautiful sunny afternoon, hopefully wherever you may be. I'm Coach Marshall Martin with Petra Coach, and I've got Mandy Burge with us. Hello, Mandy. Hey, Marshall. <laughs> Mandy's our Director of Operations at Petra Coach, and I have Coach David Pierce. And David, where are you today? I'm in Louisville today. Right and sunny here, too. I also got my Louisville shirt on today for you. Uh -huh. The Louisville Cardinals. Well, hey, it's uh, good to have both of you here. And for those of you turn, tuning in, uh, you're welcome to send questions into the chat. Uh, and uh, But what we're going to talk about today is, uh, believe it or not, where is this year gone? We're now into November and never too early to start thinking about the end of the year. And so what better way to look at the end of the year than through the lens of our Rockefeller Habits model and the four disciplines, uh, be it people, strategy, execution, and cash. So team, what I'd like to do today is uh, as we assemble uh, through our experiences working with our members, uh, what are those things that we can start to think about in areas of people, strategy, execution, and cash so people can start working towards getting ready to finish up 2020. And if you, uh, for those of you who love 2020, you got an extra hour of 2020 last weekend <laughs> when we set our clocks back. And uh, for those of you who are not, we've got uh, roughly 55 more days and we get to put it behind us. But let's start off into people. When you think about approaching the end of the year in regards to people, uh, what are some of those things that we could be doing uh, with our people or finish up this year or get ready for next year that would position us well heading into the cal new calendar year? Marshall, I think you touched on it briefly when you said um, wrapping up 2020. And I, I've seen that sometimes people get so focused on the next year or they are so excited about the new, what's new, like let's just bury 2020 and move on to 2021, that they are already thinking of Q1. They're thinking of a January start and they need to be doing that, but they also need to be focusing on what are we doing in the remaining 55 days? Uh, what are my final goals for the year? How can I kind of like really ramp up or finish those last minute tasks or get that last priority done um, before we move forward to the next? So I think from people's standpoint, it's really important to look at your own goals, to look at your team's goals and making sure that the focus is still on today. What can I execute on today that's going to benefit the company or myself for the next 55 days so that in Q1, I'm ready to go. Let's, let's do a little bit of wrap up maybe by the end of the year. Yeah, I think a lot of it, playing off that, Mandy, I think. Part of it is looking back over the year and finding all the learnings, mm -hmm. mistakes, things didn't work well, so that you obviously that you don't repeat them into going into 21, but those are real growth areas for you. If you go back and really analyze, we just call them autopsies. When something didn't go right, let's autopsy this thing and make sure that we don't do the same thing next year uh, and, and look for the learning. So I think a part of regrouping for year end and starting a new year is kind of looking over the past, learning from the past, and, and, and really deep diving into those things where you can really grow with them as opposed to just say, yeah, it didn't work, we'll try something else. Let's really di find the reasons and grow with that. So well worth the effort to, to, to devote some time to, to doing that. Then you can close the door and move forward, I think, at that point. So I think this year is a little, not a little, this year is quite unique. <laughs> when we think about you know, what worked, what didn't. When I think about this year and think about many of us have been uh, redistributed to a remote workforce and we need to find those ways to reconnect, uh, however we reconnect in a way to maintain good relationships with our people. And then I also like to even reinforce how do we take care of ourselves first? So what are those things that, you know, we do work around a one page personal plan. And I believe that uh, the one page personal plan probably has more power and positioning this year than ever before. And David, maybe you can start off telling us a little bit about what a one page personal plan is. And then Mandy, maybe you can go to talking about how we use that one page personal plan to reconnect with our people in conjunction with winding down this year and setting ourselves up for next year. So David, you want yeah, to go into one, that? One page personal plan is really it creating the life that you want, as opposed to letting life just hand it to you. Uh, we spend so much time in our businesses 
putting plans together and where we want to go, but we spend little time on our own personal lives, including our families, on creating life that we want. <clears throat> so we, we've taken that and put it into a, called a one-page personal plan that allows us to look, look at our future and put ourselves out there three years, 10 years, five years, whatever it is, and say, what do we want it to look like from a relationship standpoint, from financial standpoint, from routines? And you put yourself out there and you can see it. And the, if you can see that in your mind, then you can begin to put plans in place to get you there. Uh, another uh, component, it, it kind of hit on this, this unusual year, uh, Marshall, before we hand it off. I think a component we've all got to build into our plans next year is a little mental, mental health uh, <laughs> uh, relief. I think we've all suffered from this pandemic in a lot of different ways that maybe we don't even realize yet. So I think mental health should be on our checklist for next year or right now uh, as we're thinking about next year. What are we going to do to preserve our health and then our team's health? Because uh, I believe there's a lot of pent up issues that are going to begin to re reveal themselves, themselves, especially if the winter season causes us to shut down again and we get, you know, get, have to go, go um, uh, behind closed doors for any period of time. Uh, we as leaders need to be on top of that for both ourselves and our team. And, and before I jump to Mandy, David, you're really good at this and, and I can learn from you. And, it, and that is you're good about setting up those trips and those getaways, whether it's to go ascend the mountain or whether it's go skiing or whether just to get away. And, you know, when we think about often, you know, growing up or even not even growing up, even in later years, a lot of that stuff was often felt that that was, you know, sometimes selfish, but what we're learning is, is taking care of yourself and finding that time to have some downtime to re-energize uh, is important. So maybe share a little bit about some of the things that you have done or you continue to do that allows you to disconnect from the grind called the world. Yeah. And I didn't grow up having that kind of like what you were mentioning. That wasn't something we did as a family and I, and, and, but it was something that I knew I wanted to do. Uh, for my family and for myself going forward. Uh, I, I use an analogy <clears throat> when, I, when I go through this one page plan it, with my, my team, my members, is are you gonna collect stuff? Or are you gonna collect stories? Because when you get older in life, like I'm the old guy on the team, <laughs> stories are much more important than the stuff. And the stuff really has no importance at all. But if we don't, if we're not intentional about creating the stories and that's, that's the relationship stuff, we're going to get to the end of our lives and say, man, all this, all this crap I've collected, it, it's really done me no good. Uh, I don't have the friends. I don't have the family. I don't have the things, the memories that I've created for myself and created for others. I mean, it's an impact on others as well. So stuff versus stories has really kind of driven me all my life once I had the resources to be able to do these kind of things. So, you know, it can be just a quick weekend somewhere or a, a major trip, you know, go to Europe or something. But it has been from day one, when my wife and I got married 30 years ago, from day one, that's been a priority of ours. And there's not been a year we haven't done that and uh, made, it, made it a priority. And, and I wouldn't regret, I wouldn't regret any, any minute that I spent on those kind of things. And so, Mandy, I'll let you, you know, dive into kind of the one-page personal plan, maybe even doing some work about your team, but it also brings the mindset you're awesome about capturing experiences with your little ones. And uh, having three little ones, it's really interesting how that you make each of those experiences so unique for that particular child in that particular moment on that particular event. So maybe you can speak to both of those a little bit about your own little escape mentally around how to get away from the grind of the world and then get more into the one page personal plan with the team and how you use that to uh, help the team. Ironically, I think the one page personal plan is what probably ties both of those pieces together. Um, I, I was reviewing my team's one page personal plans. And one of the things I love about working with Petra is we got kind of in groups and small groups and we shared each other's one page personal plan. And so I got feedback from my team and other coaches on things that I could do better. Um, and one of the other coaches was looking at mine and says, you know, I, I had something that was fairly general around one on one time with my kids this quarter or something like that, a very non smart goal. Mm -hmm. um, and it was changed to something very specific and three kids. And what's the specific outcome or action I wanted for each particular child? You know, I have a six year old, a three year old, and a one year old. Um, and so, very different actions, very different activities. And so, I broke that down on my one page personal plan on a quarterly basis. So now I can look in each am I doing something with the six year old? Like, I'm going to be doing very different activities, very different one on ones. 
um, with her, I make sure that you know, one of my stops and starts for this quarter was to make sure that I'm being very intentional when I'm talking to her, like get down on her eye level, um, look her in the eye rather than, you know, writing something down or just like lightly listening. Um, and it was because that I wrote that on my one page personal plan and I moved it all the way down to kind of that quarterly start stop to keep it present. Um, Cause otherwise I think it's really, really easy kind of to David's point to just get in the grind and today's another day and we're just, we're all getting through it, especially in the winter months when it's cold and it's dark, you know, it's just, it's like the groundhog's day every time some, with kids, you know, I pick them up from daycare and we just go through the same thing. Um, so the one page personal plan for myself has allowed me to be really intentional with that. Um, I moved some of those action items into a daily calendar. So each day I was checking myself to make sure that I was doing those things that I found really important. Um, so all of that was kind of from a family front. And then on a personal front, I realized that so much of myself I was doing specifically um, for my kids. And again, being at Petra, we are very um, personal, professional, health conscious, like just always be better. And so I looked at what are those things that I was doing for myself to improve myself and make myself better. And I started running kind of at the begin, beginning of COVID and really kept that up. Uh, when the time changed, that was a challenge for me because I do not love running in the dark and I'm not much of a morning person, although I'm working very hard to become a morning person. Um, and so since the time changed on Sunday, I've decided that that was one of my now new action items is now that it's sunny in the morning again, that I have to switch my afternoon run to a morning run. And so I'm back on those runs again, because it's on my one page plan. And that's just what drives all the little action items in my life. It's been incredibly helpful. Yeah. And I'll just share that, you know, for those of you who know me, I, I love uh, committing physical suicide every day <laughs> and extensively on the weekends. And what I have, uh, as much as I love to train, uh, I've, I have a newfound love for the fact that it, it is the one thing that clears my mind yeah. and I can go out and I can go at it so hard and I just, I feel re-energized. I feel my mind is clear and just that fresh air. And, you know, just thinking about even last night I was, I was out in the dark. I was a little dangerous. I need to start using my headlamp, but I'm running on a road that has too many cars. And I don't have that issue, Marshall, by the way. <laughs> but the point, the point is, is it's just that escape. And I got about six weeks, the early six weeks of the pandemic. It was, I got away from it a little bit. And then I realized that I was going the opposite direction. So those are just little things that we could do. One page personal plan. When I think about kind of building the checklist on the people aspect uh, for the end of the year. Now's a good time to be looking at, uh, for sales, looking at comp plans and redoing comp plans if we need to redo comp plans. So many companies go into the next year and they have a sales team and, you know, they have those agreements that they sign off on becomes a comp plan for the year. And when those things don't get done until January or February, that is so, such a morale killer for the sales team. Uh, setting the annual goals for your people you know, what are those things, you know, what are those things that, you know, the people need to be working on that they have, think about annual initiatives in the company aspect, but what are those things that we can be working on? And again, I think David, your point, looking back, what did we have to leave behind or, or pivot from this year that couldn't get done that either needs to get picked up or gone forever. And so uh, uh, I think those are all good. Can you guys think of anything else in regard to just people specific the only, the only last thing I'll add in is um, ironically had this conversation this morning was when you are doing some sort of end of the year, if you're doing an end of the year bonus or something around the holidays, you know, David said, making sure that you're looking back at the year, making sure that you're looking back at the year and celebrating the wins. Um, and if you're going to do a holiday bonus or something for the team, make it a celebration. Don't mm -hmm. just, you know, add something extra to a paycheck or hand some cash out or, you know, send a turkey or whatever the thing is that your company does, um, but, but celebrate it and make it a big deal and talk about the successes and look back at this year and talk about the celebrations. I think, um, I know in most planning sessions when it's time to review the wins and great things, everybody just wants to skip past that page really quickly to get to the losses. Like what are all the things that didn't go well? Where can we, where can we improve? Where can we fix? But especially at the end of the year, and especially as a leader looking with your team, I think it's really important to look at the wins and great things and celebrations and make it a celebration. Like we got through 2020, you did a phenomenal job. Here's all the things that you accomplished this year. Um, here's some maybe next action items. Here's a bonus to celebrate you for all of those things. Um, and just don't let it pass you by, really celebrate it. 
Yeah. 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 Marshall, I had one thing, a little plug for our Petra Forum groups uh, yesterday yeah. we had. We got into this conversation about next year and comp plans. And it's very interesting. The CEOs uh, that, that talked about their plans, the ones that, that did an annual type plan where they only have a bonus at the end of the year, they kind of, they were very unfavorable talking about it. It wasn't really appreciated. It was kind of an expectation. But the ones that, that had plans that at least measured it on a more pure frequent basis, quarterly, maybe even paid it out biannually, they had more bang out of it. They got their team members much more engaged as opposed to waiting at the end of the year to see how I did. So if you there's just a learning, if you're going to be doing these things, thinking about 21, frequency of feedback and reward is much more impactful than that thing that happens at the end of the year. Uh, it just that's just a learning that we had yesterday that really was a light bulb moment for several of us on the call uh, that I think are going to result in some changes. So kind of a tip, I guess, uh, if, you, if you're thinking about doing that, consider a more frequent type reward plan, incentive plan, as opposed to just an annual thing. Uh, you'll get your team much more engaged. Yeah, that's one. That, that speaks a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. I'm, I'm personally not a huge component of uh, annual performance reviews. Uh, I am more of a proponent of, in our world, we have the two-weeker conversation, which is part of the meeting rhythms. And you figure if you have 52 weeks in a year, take out a couple of weeks for vacation, you've got, you know, roughly 25 occurrences. And I tell people, you know, hit somewhere north of 20. It's probably 20 to 22 in there. But it's just so frustrating earlier in my career when I'd show up at the end of the year, I was on the receiving end of a re review. I was well aware of all the memos. They were called memorandums back then. All the memos that went out about how everyone needed to scurry along and get the reviews done and get them turned in and check the box. And you never talk to your manager all year long. And then all of a sudden, the only thing they remembered was about the last 30 days of your performance. And that's what you were judged on. And you had a scoring system from zero to five and they gave you a five. So you get part of your share of your 3.2% merit increase. It was spread across the company. And it just felt so impersonal. And I always tell people that when you do the two weekers, you have 20 to 22 times to sit down and have a frank conversation with someone to celebrate. You can celebrate success every two weeks, if you wish. I'm also not a fan of mixing performance reviews in with any kind of pay adjustments because I feel like people don't listen to the performance reviews. They just want to know what they got in additional money and it really creates a separation. So uh, thinking about, you know, look for opportunities to give praise and recognize wins and great things uh, because people like to do a good job if they know what a good job is. And sometimes people come to work and this is their happy place and where they find fulfillment in regards to happiness because when they leave work, there's so much stress and strain outside. So, uh, you know, when we go to conferences uh, with the people that we work with or the broader people that do what we do, uh, when you ask people strategy, execution and cash, uh, and which one's most important. It's always north of 40% the people. So it's not any accident that we started today talking about people. You get the people right and everything else falls in line. Always. So that's people. Let's, uh, let's pivot to strategy. So this one's really interesting. And again, when we look at planning for the end of the year, overlaid by what we've gone through this year, strategy is, you know, what is that strategy that's contributing to year over year growth and is this connected all the way from the top of the organization down to the bottom of the organization? And is it effective? And so many people this year have not necessarily been forced to change their strategy, but I think 100% of the people have been forced to evaluate their strategy. So going into the end of the year, and this ties into our annual resets and the planning, but going into the end of the year, maybe both of you can speak to some best practices around getting that strategy tweaked or getting it right heading into next year. Andy, we'll start. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, we, we just looked at our, our annual planning. So ours will come up in February. Um, and we looked through, we just did our quarterly planning a couple weeks ago. Um, and the first place we looked is that long-term. Uh, I was really, really surprised to look at our three to five year and say, hmm, there's really not many tweaks. A couple increases, a couple little changes there, maybe an, an ownership. 
but I was uh, really pleased to see that the direction of the company has not pivoted as much. And Marshall, you alluded to that a little bit when you said, um, you know, people are looking at change. And I think when people look back at 2020, they envision just a total different shift. Um, and I'm sure that that's probably has happened for a lot of industries, but the, the goal of the company is always gonna come back to the foundation. So it's always gonna come back to what is the why, why do we exist, you know, the what, the how, and, and I don't think that those change too terribly different um, so that the longer term strategy is probably going to be um, somewhat in place, um, especially looking at the BHAG and some of those longer term goals. Now, throughout the year, I'm, I'm sure that companies have pivoted and they should have pivoted. You know, they should have changed maybe a quarterly, uh, but at the end of the year, um, I think it goes back to the same thing I mentioned on the people side is making sure that you're still executing, this ties into execution a little bit, um, but the execution of that, that strategy so that um, we can check those off, see what worked and what didn't work, and then replan for next year. You mentioned doing it before the, the holidays, and I think that's also um, just a strong idea because I think when January comes, you want to have your strategy set so that you have the entire year to work on it. So doing some of that resets really around November and around the December timeframe when you're still in that kind of wrap up review mode. And then what is the big goals for 2021 look like? And then come back from the new year, ready to run and ready to start work on day one. Yeah. I think one thing to consider, some things to consider about looking, resetting your strategy in, the, in kind of the longer term, the three to five year term, is I think the pandemic has taught us that Worst case can happen, especially <laughs> in some of the hospitality areas. Yeah. Uh, and we used to kind of throw that out and not give that a lot of consideration. But I think we've got to do that now. And I think even more so, we typically do it in a one-year time frame where we do scenario analysis. I think we should do scenario analysis on a longer term frame now, given what we learned this year. Uh, because when these things hit, it's not a quick fix. So some of some of our members or some of the people in the industries have been really impacted. They've got a three-year window. They're going to have to play out of this thing, and it's not going to happen this year. Uh, so I think throwing scenario analysis for some pretty pretty broad cases of, of what could happen is very important at the long-term level as much as it is at the one-year level, which is typically where we focus our scenario analysis. So Worst case can happen. We need to be prepared <laughs> for that. And if we are, we can often put mitigating factors in that, that we would have never thought about if we, if we consider the possibility of that. Yeah, a couple of things this year has taught us is, you know, the work that we do it makes um, strategic planning more integrated into just normal business versus being that heavy lifting, shove it in the drawer and leave it out there to get dust on it. And I think what it has, the most successful companies, it has caused them to be closer to that strategic plan, to be paying attention. We see so many instances where people set three to five year plans. And even if they don't review it, they still look back over time and they're moving towards it and checking the box and getting some things done. Uh, I just, I laugh when it used to be that if someone put, you know, a pandemic, uh, inside of a SWOT analysis as a threat, you just kind of chuckled. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, this would be the only thing I say about this, so just tread <laughs> lightly. But honestly, it used to be like every fourth year, someone says, oh, well, the effects of an election year, and it never really came into play. And so we've learned that, you know, <laughs> anything's possible today and don't rule out anything, right? And so what does it prepare for the worst and then everything else is better, right? That's right. Uh, but, but strategy is one thing that that we encourage as well, you know, make sure that you don't just do the act of planning and then, you know, not even a full quarter goes by. Those monthly meetings, do some strategic planning. And in fact, strategic planning, even outside of the work we do that does quarterly execution planning and annual planning, uh, the, the act of strategic planning is a muscle that you have to exercise. And by getting teams together, and I push a lot of members through to push them through to put ideas out in advance of meetings where you're going to discuss strategy and put the information out that's going to be reviewed in the meeting and go ahead and state what you want as a result of the attendees and start to warm up those discussions because so often people show up, nice hot cup of coffee and a meeting breaks out. And then all of a sudden you start talking about strategy. People have no idea what it is you're going to talk about. Everyone's excited because it's something new that we don't know the answer to. 
and then it just ends up in kind of a watered down mess and it just drags along. So we need to get the discipline and rigor of strategy and how to talk strategically. And I also even tell people in meetings before you talk about strategy, take a bio break or take a break to go clear your head and come back and walk into the room. And now we're gonna specifically get into strategy. Don't just make it part of an ongoing meeting that just becomes the next topic. Step out of tactical, walk in, get into strategic mode and learn to have that discipline and rigor inside the room where we talk and act strategically. And then what is the outcomes that come as a result? You know, uh, the strategic plan is, is, is it's almost like to, to me, you know, we, we, we get it down to a few, a handful of things that we're really going to focus on. We're going to really do well with excellence. It, it's kind of like building an, an easy button for your business because the work's hard. But if you have it simplified and you know where you're going, anytime you get off track, you can go right back to that. Or when you have to make a decision, you go right back to your plan. And if it doesn't fit within your plan, it's an easy decision. Whereas a lot of businesses run, you know, kind of the seat of their pants and every day they're making a decision. They always have the same facts they're considering. Well, the strategic plan does that for you. I don't want to discount. It's not easy, but that's kind of your easy button to me. You can always go back to, to your plan and it'll help you direct your thoughts and decision making. Just really powerful. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've noticed, I think this year about strategy more than ever is that because there was such a disruption and I think the strategy that people set from the beginning, um, at least for us, we said, well, if we're going to pivot and if we're going to change, let's go ahead and change big. Yeah. Might, might, might as well. You know, it's kind of that um, if we're going to go ahead, we did a CRM implementation and some new hires. And if we're going to change, let's go ahead and change big. Let's go ahead and, and pull the bandaid off, because I think that um, organizations or companies just get used to the same old, same old. And they set, you know, a little bit higher goal the next quarter. The strategy is, you know, 10 percent more, 20 percent more. But they kind of stay in a, maybe a safety zone of what they know they can accomplish so they can, you know, check the box at the end of the year, the end of the quarter um, or they go crazy far and never hit them, you know, but that is kind of one of those. And I, I think that a lot of organizations, our organization in particular, looked at this year and said, wow, we've had some disruptions. Those plans that we had have changed a bit. Let's take the opportunity and let's really do that thing we always talked about. Let's get started, but let's do more. Let's go bigger. Let's do extra hires. Let's get the next level up um, to prepare for the disruption. Um, and so I've been really pleased to see uh, a lot of companies doing that and taking this opportunity to really focus on those big projects since everything was already messed up anyways. Let's look at the strategy, let's realign, and then let's just go 200% towards it and really, really focus. You know, I hope it's changed the mindset of companies going forward. Let's try the big stuff. Let's yeah. break some stuff. Yeah. Not wait for the pandemic. Let's think that way all the time. Uh, and I think I've seen that a lot, a lot of the companies that we work with, they are going to do some different things they never would have tried before, but it's an ongoing thing. It's not just this year. And that's the mindset you want to have. And I think that's allowed some of them, given them permission to be like that. So. For sure. I think another thing we need to make sure that people are aware of is often when things are going well, people get complacent and they just assume that they have a great strategy or they just assume that everything's performing well. And we all know I'm, wired a little backwards sometimes, but it was always in business when things were going well, that's when I felt like I was doing my best work because I wanted to really understand what is it that's making it go well. And I think we come off a 10 year run here where in business, in some businesses, uh, things kind of came to us a little easier than others. And it put us in a situation where that we probably got our eye off the ball a bit. So I just challenge everyone out there to, uh, no matter how well things are going, ask yourself why, because it could be a false positive. It's kind of one of those situations where that, you know, when we evaluate sales professionals, it's, oh, they had a great year. But when you look back at how they had a great year, they didn't necessarily have a great year as a result of the work that they did. And we, it's okay to have some luck along the way, but we really got to dig in and push that strategy, good or bad. Uh, because if there's things that we're finding that are going well, then we may need to to lean into those or thrust into those. And if there's things are not going well, we've got to cut and run and have a good reaction time. Whenever anybody says I had a great year, it's compared to what, mm -hmm. you know, what are you comparing to yourself, your peers 10 years ago? So it's exactly right. What's your measurement there, Marshall? I mean, you might be having a great year just because the economy was good or because your, your market's growing and no, no, you're not doing any influence that. 
So yeah, compared to what is so important, I think when people are evaluating how they did or how they're doing, uh, to make sure they got the right metrics or comparison, comparing themselves to. Well, and also not being so quick to give up sometimes on your strategy. I know on March 12th, I had a conversation with a business owner uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, that business owner that day on March 12th stated that I'm afraid I'm going to lose my business and I need to stop planning. And I need, I mean, just complete like mm -hmm. everyone else in this world. Yeah. We were all panicked, right? And at the time, the business is doing you know, 2.6, 2.8 million dollars a month or so in revenue. And I said, no, you're not going to let up. We're going to lean into this and we're going to stay on it and we're, we're not going to give up. And uh, two days ago, I had a conversation. This same business is now doing over $4 million a month in business. Mm -hmm. And we laugh all the time. And he says, thank you for keeping my head in the game because if it just it's easy when you feel panic, just start grabbing levers and stopping everything. Mm -hmm. The natural human response is, is start stopping everything and going to control what you think you can control. And it's not always the answer. So uh, we just have to stay, you know, uh, there's a book, Strategic Intuition, that basically says your hypothesis is a theory and the theory holds true till otherwise proven untrue. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes your strategy is right. And sometimes people chicken out on their strategy before it's had time to materialize. So stay on your strategy and don't give up until otherwise proven untrue. Let's pivot to, uh, let's pivot to execution. I love execution. So. <laughs> I love execution because that's where you take that strategy and deliver it into bottom line. Profits in the end of the year is a great reflection time to be looking at those things that are broken or need to be taken on and Mandy, I'm gonna let you lead us off here. When you think about execution, because I know how much you love a good process, uh, good give process. us some give us some tips on how we wind up the year on process or execution, and how we uh, either culturally or tactically inside of processes get better moving forward. I think you touched on it earlier when you talked about complacency. I think organizations have a tendency to see that something works and say this is good, and then they just continue to do it that way. Um, you know, one of Petra's core values is ask why and improve. So always looking at something is how can we do it better, faster, more efficient? How can we make more money off of it? Like there's always, always, always an improvement. We've talked a lot about um, better you this year and I've talked a lot about on a personal level. And I think from a business perspective, it's the same. Um, I, I, I don't like to see companies that get so stuck in this is working. We've tested it. It works. Have you, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? There's just always new and better ways to look at something. Um, we are probably the leaders of that. Um, I say no two days at Petra are ever the same because we're always looking for some sort of action. This company moves and we move fast and I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I think I'd be really bored somewhere else if, if it was just the same old, same old every day. Now that means you have to stay on your toes and, and, throwing in add a new process, we're looking at a new quote tool and spent some time and it didn't work the way that I work, that I wanted. So I'm doing it again. And I'm changing a couple other levers and pulling a couple different things to see the outcome that I want um, rather than just taking no. So I always look at the end of the year, again, a little bit of reflection of what worked and what didn't work. Um, what can I finish up this year from execution? And then um, what are those big things? Like what, what's the big goal for next year? And then step one, step two, and just really making all the little steps for myself, for my team um, to drive those, those big goals for the whole year. I think it's really important. We're, you know, we're two months away from year end and everybody starts thinking about the holidays and you kind of, a lot of businesses kind of wind down, slow down at the end of the year, which I think is a big mistake. I think the, the mantra should be finished strong because that creates momentum into 21. Uh, and you know, it's it, just like stopping a barge. It's hard to get that thing going again. So <laughs> if you slow everything down at year end, you're, it's going to take a while the first quarter to get everything ramped up again. So if you really finish strong and have that mindset, you're going to run into 21 and be, you know, full, full steam ahead instead of uh, we're back on the holidays. I may go visit this guy at the end of March, end of January. And before you know, it's the end of Q1 and, and things are just starting to hum. So finish strong, I guess, would be the thing that from an execution standpoint with it, I'd, that, that I would, would be my uh, mindset. The other thing, and, and Mandy talked about that, is move fast. Don't wait for perfection or think you got to have all the information. You never get all the information. 
you know, get, you know, 70% of it and make a call and don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, put up some guardrails so you don't sink the ship, but pull the trigger sooner rather than later when you're, when you're attempting to do things, because we often wait around. I, I'm still investigating. I'm still investigating. I'm still, and, and, you know, six months later, we're still investigating mm-hmm. and, and you never pull the trigger. So don't wait for everything to be known before you make those calls and that'll create momentum as well. Nothing like doing something and not work and then having to scramble and find another solution that really cre- creates a lot of energy within your organization. Uh, and, and you can turn that on a positive versus a negative. So finish strong and, you know, and, and make decisions and move quickly, quicker than we, pr- than you probably do today. Uh, we'll create a lot of execution. I call it momentum going forward. David, on your finish strong, I specifically remember um, there's a couple members that I used to work with and they would do these themes at the end of the year to say, you know, if we hit this high sales goal or if we create this number of widgets or whatever the big goal was that was a strong finish, then here's kind of the carrot at the end of the year. Um, And so they would do that finish strong and really drive something that is going to make the team do that extra effort each day, you know, in the months of November and December um, and not totally get in that holiday mindset where you're, you're taking time off before the holidays even here. Um, Cause there's a carrot at the end. It was at maybe extra PTO or an extra holiday bonus or um, something extra fun at the Christmas party, something that was incentivizing to the team, but also really drove that strong finish. And I loved, I remember a couple of companies doing that um, is their Q4 theme. And so it's kind of a way to take that finish strong and make a theme out of it, you know, put the reward and celebration at the end and drive that really high point at the end, rather than just kind of petering off into the holidays. Yeah, I think, you know, with processes, it's often best practice to have critical numbers associated with them when possible. And then really pushing to drive that meaningful outcome that is that critical number or impact that you want. And I'm a big believer in really breaking processes even before they need to be, even before they're failing. Uh, and so, you know, how do we just get those incremental gains or that 1%? Also too, uh, I look at writing or having processes in a way that those are things that you can drive down inside the organization to give less experienced people a chance to go document how a process works. In many cases, they'll come back with better ideas than you have about the way the process works, or that's a way to get uh, training for those people, or it's a way to develop those or identify those shining stars inside the business. So I always look quarter over quarter and what processes can we deliver down to someone in the organization, give them a shot at going to document it. And then what can we learn from it? And then periodically just be revisiting. Now, in the work we do, the pace chart is certainly usually those five or 10 processes that should be reviewed at least each month within the leadership team to reprioritize where that they would fall if you had extra time to go work on those. But, you know, in any given business that we work in or at any given time, there's not less than two dozen processes that probably either need to be written or revised or uh, re-engineered. And so, you uh, uh, it's also another way that you're ever going to graduate out of the work or the job or the role that you're in until you can document what it is and be able to create in a way that you can train someone else on it. Uh, it's going to be a ball and chain to you and enjoy where you are because you're never going anywhere in the organization. We have to look beyond creating that need where I'm the only person that knows how to do this, therefore have job security. You've got job security. All right. You'll be there 10 years from now and never move along. So uh, yeah, that's uh, on execution, you know, a little clean up at the end of the year, but also go back and look at your profitability and, and look at those financial statements relative to the execution and, you know, look at that, you know, cost of goods sold or look at those labor hours or look at the overtime hours or look at those waste as a result or those callbacks. Look at all of those things that were as a result of some process that may have failed and start to associate real dollars with them so you can start to understand. Because at scale or at lots of volume, inefficiencies can be hidden by the sheer fact of the amount of money that's out there. And you know, one percentage point on a hundred million dollar company, you know, is a lot of money, but it can get hidden because you make up for it somewhere else. So that's the execution. It's a good pivot, uh, pivot into cash there, Marshall. Yeah, pivot yeah. into cash. And I'm going to look at my good friend, Dave. You'll make a great Pearson. moderator one day, Marshall. <laughs> What's that? 
<laughs> You're gonna make a great moderator one day here. <laughs> so how about David? We get in the end of the year and you know, we've got bank covenants and we've got year end financials and we've got cash flow forecast. Give us some insights as, as we wind down some of the things that we can set ourselves up for the coming year and be really fiscally responsible in regards to books and records and, and ultimately the cash for the business. Yeah, I think one of the first things I, I, I tell a company or I work with a company is you, you need to get control of your funding, your financing. And the best source of funding growth is internally. And the only way you can do that is to have a really efficient operation that you continually look at on improving. Uh, because if you're dependent on outside sources, they're not always going to be there when you need them. And if, let's say, you get into a recession, you know, banks are going to call on lines of credit. They're going to reduce lending uh, output. Uh, so you can't say, I've always had this and, and depend on So now's the time to really look, how can I maximize my internal funding sources? Really just, you know, how do you do it? And how do you run efficiently in your business to generate the most cash flow? Uh, now's a, a good time to do. You've got a full year's worth. You can compare it to several years. You've got a lot of analytics, a lot of, uh, of financial information you can do analytics on to come up with ways you can improve that. Uh, so how can I become more efficient? Uh, and also you're in, and it's kind of accepted. Uh, and most people don't, don't always, a lot of people don't always take advantage of it. People somewhat expect prices, new prices to come out every, with an annual, on an annualized basis. And a lot of companies don't really use that to their advantage. Um, my my two, 2021 price is now this because, uh, and, and they don't do that. And small changes in pricing, as we've shown in some of the tools we use, can really have a significant impact. And most customers are price insensitive if you're delivering what they want and need and they believe in you. If you're selling a commodity, it's one thing. But if you've got a true customer who values what you do and deliver, they're a lot more price insensitive than you give them credit for. And you should be allowed to pass on price increase. Your costs go up. You should be able to reprice modestly if, if you need to without any impact on the current customer. And so I would say don't miss the opportunity to improve your revenues based on your current existing, your current customer base. Uh, and the end of the year and beginning of the year is a great time to kind of think through all your pricing mechanisms and say, where are some improvements I could make? It's, it's funny. Some companies don't change prices for 10 years. And you say, have you ever changed price? No, I haven't. When's the last time? They can't even remember. Uh, so that, that they miss that opportunity. Year end's a good time to do that because your customers are kind of ex more accepting of annual, annual increases in your pricing. So don't miss that opportunity. That's, that's, that's a biggie. David, why do you think that is? Because I've seen uh, customers as well, or members as well, that when we talk about price increase, especially in a service-based business, are so reluctant to do that, or, or we can't do that, we're, we're afraid we'll lose our member base. You know, at, at sometimes a small price increase, you could make the dollars up very, very quickly. Why do you think that hesitation is for some of those organizations? Well, it comes back to the organization itself. You know, they don't, maybe they don't have 100% belief that what they deliver is what they mm -hmm. promise so if you are totally confident that the value you commit to, you're delivering and more, those companies don't have an issue with that. Uh, I think that the, where the questioning comes in is, is uh, I, I, yeah, I think I do what I'm supposed to do and what I say I'm doing, but I'm not really sure. And I don't want to test that. You know, if you have 100% confidence, you're delivering a fair product, a price at a fair product at a fair price. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things shouldn't come to play and they normally don't. Uh, also, the other side of that, Mandy, is when I, as the owner, feel like I've been ripping everybody off all along. Uh, I can't, I can't ask for more. I'm already ripping them <laughs> off. You know, you hope you don't have that mindset, but I know I've yeah. seen people feel that way. Mm -hmm. I'm overcharging now. There's no way I can get more than I'm already getting. So there's kind of a guilt thing there that that comes into play as well. Sometimes uh, it is just that small dollar amount that can really make a big impact to the bottom difference. line. Huge difference. Well, I think David, you bring up a good point in regards to. What happens is, is, is three, four, or five, or even more than that goes by. And then all of a sudden, what happens is, is you feel the need to have some type of dramatic yeah. price increase. And then it's ill-received. Now, let's talk about price increases in specific. Regardless of what the price increase is, you're still going to get pushback. Sure. But there's two questions you can ask that customer, member, or uh, whoever it may be, is always ask the two following questions. 
do you not see the value or you wonder how you're going to pay for it? Now, I'd rather, well, actually, I'm fine with either way that they're answered because if it's, I don't see the value, most of the time when it says, oh, no, I see the value is I don't have to pay for it. But it is a good dialogue to say, well, walk me through if you don't see the value and let's talk about that. Or why do you, or just ask the question, why do you ask? And the answer oftentimes is I ask all the time. And so, but people do shy away. If you're not doing your best work, don't be raising prices. If you feel really good about you doing what you're supposed to do and you can speak to the value you deliver to that person and even quantify it specifically, then don't be ashamed of it. Also best practices too is any type of contract or agreements, there should be some language in there that specifically says that is our desire to hold prices, but we may occasionally adjust prices for market conditions or whatever that might be. And it gives you a way to have a dialogue. Uh, I know I used to uh, do work with American Honda. And <laughs> they wanted the price to decrease every year. Yeah. So think about that. And, and after they talked through it, it made a lot of sense because they pride themselves in having a lower increase than others in the market. So they said over a period of three years, we worked together for three years, we should be gaining efficiencies working together, not going the opposite direction. So uh, get yourself into best practice about looking for when it makes sense for price increases. And it's just good business. You don't want to get back in the corner and just, um, it's no fun if you continue to do work and your prices go up and your margins erode and the person on the other end is still getting value. And then you feel like you've got kind of a, uh, sour taste as a result. I'm going to put my counting hat on too, Marshall, Mandy. On the other side of that, now's the time to go back to your key vendors or some of your vendors and, and talk about pricing with them. You know, they, they often have things that we don't take advantage of, you know, multi-year contracts that could reduce your pricing. Uh, or we have a, you know, a, a long time customer reward system that, that you haven't taken doesn't hurt to ask. I mean, you want to be fair with everybody, obviously, but you should also look for opportunities to gain uh, efficiencies on the pricing side for your vendor relationships as well. And vendors are okay with that. You know, if, if, if you're open and honest with them, um, you know, they're probably more than willing if it establishes a stronger customer with you to help you out in that area. So I would go to the other side. It's kind of the other, it's the other side of the equation, but look at both sides, both ability to raise your prices but also a better way uh, to, to reduce your cost on the other side with some of your vendors, or, or maybe you maybe you go and look for some other opportunities to, to buy products or services you haven't looked at before. So don't forget about the other side as well. Yeah. What about David, I know that we did a really good job um, internally. And a lot of companies did probably in March and April and calling all the vendors to get reduced pricing and, and was really mindful of spending, you know, um, a lot of organizations watched every single dollar that went out and just tracked it all. And then as the year has continued on and maybe things have improved, lightened up on that a bit. Uh, we had a call a couple of weeks ago with our accounting outsourced accounting team and they were chatting with us about how so many of the companies that they work with have just, you know, opened up the floodgates and spending is right back to where it used to be. And they don't have that mindful eye. So, you know, looking at a month over month and really watching those expenses and having those conversations with the vendor, just because it's not March doesn't mean that those terms still aren't available. And I think keeping that um, opportunity there and really monitoring spending is a small thing that I think a lot of companies don't do. They just kind of trust that everybody will do what they're supposed to do, um, which most organizations do. But when you just turn it on a little bit and a little bit and a little bit times 100 employees, it can get out of control really quickly. Kind of like you had a, if you have a room, Mandy, you got a, one table, you fill that table up. If there were three tables, you'd fill three tables up. You know, it just, just happens. It, it just happens. happens. Yep. It's nobody's fault. Nobody's doing it on purpose, but it just exactly. happens. So exactly. watching it is very important. You, you grow to the environment you're in, right? Absolutely. Every time. Uh, but again, it speaks to that complacency uh, mm -hmm. as well. So what about banking relationships, covenants? What are those kind of things you could do at the end of the year to go back and refresh those and, or in fact, lines of credit, negotiating lines of credit, even before you need them, those kind of things. Well, obviously you're in typically, you have to go back and evaluate and calculate and submit information to the bank. So obviously 
you're in is to make sure that you understand all your covenants because those come into play looking forward as you're as you're putting your strategy together. If you're going to go out and, and triple your business, what's that going to do your banking relationship covenants and things that you have specifically? So you got to weigh those in as you're planning strategy. So it's a good time to refamiliarize yourself with all your terms that you got to comply with. Um, it, it's, it's also a time to renegotiate if you got if you if you're doing well. Uh, renegotiate some terms, lend. I mean, interest rates are basically zero now, so you should have some very favorable interest rates. If you haven't taken advantage of those, uh, now's the time to ask. The other thing is I'm concerned about where the economy is going to go uh, over the next period, two years, whatever. If you read any of the reports from any of the, any of the uh, supposed experts out there, uh, it's not real favorable. Um, so it, now's the time, if you got the ability to put more liquidity in your shop through either a line or maybe even a drawn line of credit, it may be worth thinking about now because it, it, the worst time to ask for money is when you need it. Um, so I, I've had several members actually uh, put money on their balance sheets just out of loans, just and they're just, it's just sitting there. To them, it's a cost of doing business. So it's just an interest cost to them. But the security of having that cash, knowing that you know, this, this worst case thing could come back and uh, again, gives them a lot of comfort, lets them sleep at night. So I would really think about how well I'm structured from a capital standpoint and capital can be loans and or equity, but do I have some resources there that I could draw on if this pandemic thing blows up again or the recession hits? Uh, because you don't want to be begging for it when it's too late, because it won't happen. I, as the old banker in me, I know <laughs> worst time worst time I ever had with a customer is when they came to me when they needed it because they were in dire straits. So talk to your bankers and be upfront with them and, and, and work some things out. But so now is the time probably to think about your liquidity. Um, now, while things are still somewhat good, because uh, the next couple of th three years could be a kind of a a bumpy ride. Let's let's call it that. Bumpy ride. I like that. It's not doomsday, but it could be bumpy. Doomsday. Yeah. Yeah. So as we wind down here, uh, I'm going to close by asking, knowing what you know this year, what's the best advice you can give people to plan for 2021? Knowing what you know this year, how have you possibly changed your mindset and what advice would you give to others as they approach 2021? I mean, I feel like my first, like Marshall, when you asked that question, the first thing that came to mind, it was so cheesy, but I was like, shoot for the stars. And what I mean by that is whatever goal that I had set for myself or for my team or my department this year, I mean, surpassed it in insane ways, ways that I did not think were possible, ways that I felt like in hindsight, I now feel like it was, I was thinking too small um, because there was such disruption this year and because there was and sometimes extra time because there, people were sitting at home, um, the opportunity to do something with that time and to do something with that focus was present more than I've ever, ever had personally. And so I, I think that for myself, it's opened up my thought process to um, not think small anymore and to think a lot bigger for myself personally and for the business. And so my, to anybody else, I would say the same thing. If, if you think that there's something that you cannot do, you absolutely can do it from a personal or professional standpoint. Um, I think that so many of those things that maybe were holding folks back, I mean, look at 2021 is your year to, to go for it. You have nothing left to lose. Look at 2020, it can only go up from here. It might be a little bumpy, but like we are going in a positive direction. So whatever you think your small goal is, think bigger and do bigger and it will be better. Nice, David. Yeah, I like that, Mandy. Uh, a couple of just kind of really the same line of thinking there. I think you gotta have a mindset to believe that you can versus that you can't, you know, that just, it just flips a switch when you have the positive mindset that, you know, no matter what happens, we can figure out how to get around it or get through it. I'd also go back to kind of our people side and recommit to living your purpose, both personally and as a, and as a company, the results will come. If you really live that purpose every day and everybody on your team does, uh, the result you'll get the results you want. So I would go back and really do a kind of deep thinking process and recommit to that purpose that you've set out to do business along and your personal purpose as well. Um, that may be the most important thing because the results will happen. 
if you're if you're doing the right thing from that standpoint. So uh, I guess my advice would be, what's your purpose? Do you believe it? And then recommit to it. Mm -hmm. well, you, Marshall? I have uh, stay positive in all situations and you can control positivity within your own head. Control what you can and try not to stress too much about the things that you can't. Uh, block out the noise. We live in a world that's just, there's noise around us all the time. And then the last one is one that I'm going to just keep banging the drum on. Whatever you do, you have to take care of yourself. If you don't put yourself in the best possible situation and take care of yourself, you're not going to be there to take care of others. And, you know, oftentimes you don't have to have gym memberships. You don't have to have new shoes. You don't have to have a lot of things to take care of yourselves. And, I'm disappointed and even through this pandemic coming out, I don't want to say coming out of the backside again, that's my optimism, but I'm just disappointed that people aren't rushing to get themselves in tip top condition to be the best they can be to fend off uh, what's a scary situation. But with that being said, uh, wow, what an enjoyable uh, lunch hour or, or maybe after lunch hour to share with the two of you and, uh, uh, I always like to do these and hope that people find meaning in these in a way that they take things away from here. They can go put into their business or their personal life. We got four minutes. You want to talk politics? <laughs> I do not want to talk politics. With that being said, it's probably <laughs> time that we part ways uh, because I can't imagine. Uh, hey, I can't. I, I won't even yeah. comment. So don't even uh, comment. No. Uh, but anyway, wishing you both the best and thanks for all you do for all those people, not only in your home personal life, but all those things you do for others in business. And uh, let's keep going out and impacting, positively impacting 10 million human beings. And we'll know that we've done our piece. Fair Plus enough. Plus an MHB. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Marshall. All right.